Okay, so welcome to episode eight of the Brain Training University. Uh, today we have a very special guest speaker, um, or guest lecturer, uh, at Byron Ovenstone on Instagram, so check him out. He's a really impressive guy. He's been through some crazy, like, Navy SEAL training, like, when he was telling me the stories about it. Um, it really excites and it might even be on Netflix, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> in- uh, no, we're not doing that anymore. We're not it's doing not that any- anymore. Okay. No, it fell through. We didn't get Record that Record this intro then. <laughs> 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 Welcome to episode eight of the Brain Training University. I'm your host, Dr. Vince Wong. Today we have a very special guest lecturer for the Brain Training University. His name is at Byron Ovenstone on Instagram, so check him out if you haven't already. Uh, he has an incredibly impressive physique. When I met Byron for the first time, I remember thinking, holy crap, this guy has a great physique. <laughs> so uh, we'll dive more into that. He's been, been through some really intense um, mental toughness training, Navy SEAL uh, sort of training which we'll dive deeper into later in this episode so stay tuned so welcome to the podcast at byron ovenstone thanks for having me this is going to be fun i'm excited great so why don't we start by uh, you telling us a bit about your background and what you do okay so um originally i was a sportsman so i was paid to play sport for a while which was quite cool um and then Long story short, ended up fracturing my back in two locations, um, and that kind of put a stop to the sports and stuff. Um, then all of a sudden decided I needed plan B, and I had no plan B. So got into business. I literally went on Google. I was living in London at the time, and I said, highest paying jobs in London. Um, and it turns out that financial services is the highest paying job in London. So I was like, okay, okay I'll, do, I'll do financial services. That's what we're doing. Um, realized I needed a couple degrees for that so then ended up coming to the US and I did nine months of working on um, like farming equipment and stuff to get the money I needed to be able to afford my university degrees as well as the student visas and stuff that go along with it and then yeah studied part-time worked part-time literally lived in an office while I did so because I couldn't afford rent in London um, and then yeah got got a couple of degrees behind me and s- fell into banking by accident actually um i went down the whole route of applying for the the roles as you would like on indeed and all that stuff um and just through their websites and basically they just said i'm not banking material i'm not smart enough um so i was like okay well (laughs) plan b i didn't know i didn't know what to do then and all of a sudden a consulting firm contacted me and they were like um based on sort of the stuff that you've done for this career company that i was working for um, we think you'd be a good business analyst because you're good at remodeling stuff. You're, re- you're good at process development, system integration, and we think you'd be good in banking. And I was like, well, you're the only guys that think that because everyone else has told me I'm dumb as hell, but okay, let's give it a bash. Um, so landed my first contracting role at like 75 pounds a day or something. Um, and then quickly shot up. Uh, they doubled my rates like six months later to 150, which I was stoked about until I realized that they were charging me out at 500 a day and paying me 150. So then I was pissed and I was like, this is some bullshit. So I then started looking at how I could set up my own business. Um, and then the rest is history. Started up my own consulting firm. I uh, ran that for three, three years or so, give or take. Um, and then realized actually, yeah, the money's good. I enjoyed being able to like have a lot of income um i wasn't necessarily that good at spending it like i was pretty dumb when it came to the way in which i spent my money but i just i enjoyed the process of earning money um but then i realized that i don't enjoy what i do to earn that money and there's a lot to be said for doing doing things that you enjoy to earn money rather than feeling like you're a slave to it Um, And I was definitely like a slave to my business. I hated, I literally woke up every day and I hated who I was, what I was doing, et cetera. Um, And this is where the Navy SEAL stuff came in. We, um, I went on to this thing called the project um, and basically long story short, it's with like Bedros Kulion and a whole bunch of other guys. Um, And they put you through like this 80 hour full immersion of whip your ass kind of thing. And yeah, it was I think it was like day two, maybe day two and a half. We're like 60 hours in. I'm, I'm beaten up. I'm bleeding everywhere, like sweating. I, my back was killing me so bad. And I'd blown up my shoulder. Um, so I was literally, at one point, I was like, fuck, I, I, I don't know if I'm sweating or if I'm crying. I could be doing both. I'm not sure. Sure. But I'm replaying how intense this training was because you were telling me some of the stories like off camera um, before, yeah. and 
like, what's this about you being buried alive? <laughs> Let's, why don't we explain that to the listeners firstly? Okay. okay. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, long story short, they do this thing where they transition you from bitch to beast. Um, so they bury you. Um, well, you dig your own grave and they put you in a body bag and they bury you um, for like 15 minutes or so. It's not too bad. Um, but it's just so that like the old you dies and the new you is reborn. Um, so that was the process there. It was quite fun. I actually ended up having a nap. Yeah. <laughs> I was so excited. It was the first time we'd had like a decent night's sleep or we had peace and quiet for a while. So I was like, I'm just going to use this opportunity to have a little nap. So I just <laughs> crashed, which was fun. But um, yeah, yeah, there was... Yeah, we did that. Um, we did a lot of physical stuff, a lot of like What's the hardest heavy bit lifting. for you then, Byron? What was that, sorry? What's the hardest bit for you um, during, the pro- yeah, during in- that process? I think it was more the, um, the, the mental side of stuff, actually, surprisingly, because I, I went in there pretty conditioned. Like you saw me going into that and the training mm-hmm. that I was doing. Um, I ramped it up. I, I came in there pretty hot. And for the um, listeners, just so you guys have an idea, because some people will be listening to this audio, some will be uh, watching this on video, but uh, for the listeners, um, Byron is like a tank, basically. If you're <laughs> like a proper hardcore bodybuilder with like muscles popping out from all angles, that's sort of what uh, if an image of Byron is. So just for the listeners. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, go on, go on, Byron. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I was training three times a day. So I was doing my weight session in the morning. I was doing a hit session, uh, like a 45-minute hit session in the afternoon. And then I was doing um, cardio in the evening. So it was like 5 or 10K run or like weighted cardio where I had a 20-kilo vest and I'll chuck that on and I'll go for like a five-mile walk or whatever. Um, so I went in there conditioned. Um, the physical stuff was still physical and it was tough, but it was more the mental thing. So, like, they play a lot of games with you. Um, and I think it was about eight or 10 hours in when I clocked it. And I was like, okay, basically there's no winning. We're always going to lose. Um, it's just how, whether we, process then, as a group. how many were in the process? I think we started at 14 or 15, 15. and we finished how with long, six. Uh, so you finished only six completed the whole thing. Yeah. We had one guy drop out before he even got in. Um, he saw, he heard what like day one looked like. And he was like, I'm not doing that. I'm out. Um, and then we had another guy drop in. Uh, he dropped in about 20 minutes of starting the event. Um, it literally said so like literally minute one, right? They, they, they got us and they put these like um, double black pillowcases over your head and then they PT'd us. So like you can't breathe, you can't see. So they've taken away two of your, your like vital senses, right? You, you're relying on seeing stuff and being able to breathe clearly. And now you've got these pillowcases restricting your breath and you can't see shit and you're crashing into people and you're just, it's, it's just organized chaos. That's the whole point is to just get you out of your comfort zone. Um, what made you want and, to do it in the first place? So beginning of last year, I, um, I was in like, I guess you could call it a pretty bad place where I had my business. I was actually doing pretty well. Um, but I lost an opportunity that was about a six figure deal. Um, and that spiraled me. Um, and I never really bounced back from it. Um, so for a good three or four months, I just picked up a lot of bad habits. So I was like emotionally eating. I got real fat real fast. <laughs> like I was 35% body fat, 250 uh, pounds or something stupid. Like I was 130, I think it was the highest I was, I was 117 and a half kilos, 120 kilos. Um, but of like not muscle. There wasn't very little muscle there. That was all fat. It was horrible. Um, so yeah, just spiraled, picked up a lot of bad habits. I wasn't sleeping, wasn't eat like any time I did eat, it was takeout, it was fast food, it was just trying to um quick fix stuff, right? And then I was doing like a lot of gaming as well. So I was playing on PlayStation for hours on end, playing on the PC hours on end because it was an escape from reality. Um, like I didn't want to any... well, by the way. Like yeah. it's not yeah, it's it's a spiral, like you say. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> it's it's a an escape everything was an escape for me so i was escaping through gaming or through food or um like i just didn't want to face the fact that i was i mean my business was still i was still winning i was still making money but i didn't want to face the fact that i'd taken that hit and that i potentially could be losing um and shit like that so that's how you write it yeah so um yeah sorry sorry uh just to interrupt um yeah basically so you had the six-figure deal uh, a contract you were trying to land and then you didn't mm-hmm. get it and that somehow set you off on this path of 
self-destruction self, self-destructing hard yeah real hard um so it was like it was signed on the dotted line and it was like i'm about to do the motion of signing and then it was ripped out from under me and i was like no sorry actually we don't going to do that we're going to do something else and i was like oh, damn so and also i had already that this is where i'd like you learn in business right i'd already started spending the money before i'd even earned it so now i had i had pushed my my level of comfort to meet that income and then all of a sudden that income wasn't there so now like the the um the buffer that i had disappeared completely because that contract's no longer coming in so that money's not there um so, so mind you thought you had that uh six figure contract and you were spending on that level but yeah. you, you hadn't yeah. accounted for the the idea that it wouldn't go through is that yeah because you wouldn't have thought that it wouldn't go through right you you literally your your final stages you've already you you've you've reviewed you've you've like laid out terms and conditions blah 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 it's all there the last step is just sign the dotted line and then it's like actually no take that back we're not doing that anymore we've decided to run with something else um so yeah it's it's one of those things though like until you can tell people not to do that but until you're in that situation you naturally just want to do it because you're like Oh, I know I'm going to have this money coming in. Why am I driving this piece of shit BMW or something when I could be driving an Audi R8 or a Porsche? So you're like, I don't want this BMW you now. Get rid of that. Let's buy this Porsche because I know the money's coming, but it's not okay. coming because it hasn't done. Exactly. So yeah, yeah I lived. I mean, you saw my flat. Like I, I really nice picked place. Up, I picked up that flat and I was like, I'm, I'm posh now. I'm like, I've made it. <laughs> Indoor golf, virtual golf, gym, everything. I was like, yeah, this is happening. Like, Got let's do it. Virtual golf in his basement. When I saw that, I was like, holy shit! I need to get on this guy's level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was nuts, right? Um, well, as, and then that's humans, just we tend to have pain as one of the biggest motivating factors. Well, personally, in my experience, pain is a it forces you to learn because it really mm -hmm. makes you self reflect when you go through a painful process such as what Byron is expressing, and and two, pain can be used as leverage. People, I want people to understand this from a mental side of things. In your brain, you can use pain, a painful emotional experience, to motivate you for the future and take that into your future and and actually remember that oh i don't want to experience this thing again so i'm gonna be this person instead of this person and i think that's such a really important point to emphasize because Byron's a prime example of someone who's done that use pain as a motivating factor to go on to succeed in life and mm -hmm. in business and in numerous areas so why don't we talk a bit more of that side of things Byron? the pain of it <laughs> um yeah i mean like you say it was just it was one of those things where um you can you can talk about it all you want and like so there's i think anyway there's there's two types of learners there's those who can learn from other people's mistakes and there's those who have to experience it themselves and i kind of fit in between the two somewhere weirdly enough because i like to learn from other people but then even though i know not to do that i every now and then i still fall into the category of but maybe i'm the exception to the rule so let me try this out and then i get my ass whipped and then i'm like oh okay yeah i'm not the exception i am the rule it's not be a dickhead how i've come to process what you just said um is basically when people uh i'm trying to explain it from a brain perspective so it's slightly <laughs> complicated to simplify but um basically when you what well, surround well a surround yourself with the right people you you put yourself in an environment to win and and b when you use pain um as an emotion a powerful emotion it can be and this is something that is one of the most misunderstood parts of emotions in general because people try to avoid pain. They try yeah. to avoid failure. They try to avoid all these things and they never get the life experience like Byron has for an extremely painful experience to go, holy crap, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like for me, one of the biggest things is because I've had to live in a car and I've had to live in an office and stuff like that. I know what having zero money is like. So then when I actually started getting to the point where I got close to being in that position again, that triggers you to like pull out all of the stops. You don't know how far you're prepared to go until you're like backed into a corner and you have to fight your way out. So that's where if we reel this back to the original question that you asked me about, why did I do the project? It's because I was in a terrible terrible headspace i was spiraling i was getting out of control and i was just like miserable with life man i just hated who i was i couldn't even look at myself in the mirror i was embarrassed of who i had become um would you say you got, were depressed at the time 
I don't know if I experienced depression, um, but I definitely hated who I was. I don't think, I think, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe, but at the same time, I don't, I'm, maybe I'm just against, yeah, I just, it was, it got to a point where I just didn't enjoy who I was. And I was like, well, okay, we can sit here and mope about it and continue doing what you're doing and just get worse and worse and worse, or you can do something about it. Um, so that's when I think, that's when I kind of decided that I needed to start picking up some healthier habits. Um, so I stopped drinking like 18 to 24 cups of coffee a day because that's what I was fueling my body on. Um, cause I was working 20 hour shifts pretty much at the consulting firm. Um, cause again, that was an escape from my reality. Um, so rather than working 20 hours a day, I cut it down to say like 18 hours a day and I used an hour to train. I did, um, I started drinking a lot more water instead of coffee and energy drinks. Um, and I just started pairing a lot of bad, a uh, lot of good habits with stuff that I was already doing. Um, and then started like shifting some of the weight, started feeling better and then just started compounding that. So I started doing like a lot of journaling, a lot of gratitude, uh, meditation, things like that. Um, and that's where like, you know about 75 hard you do it all the time um i haven't i haven't done it strictly um but i i kind of bastardized his thing and i created my own version that worked for me that was what i knew i needed to do to get from where i was to where i wanted to be um and then it was just a case of making sure i execute on those every single day so it didn't matter if it was like midnight and i hadn't drunk four liters of water that day I was like, well, I'm going to chug four liters of water and go to bed. And then I'm going to need to pee in an hour, but so be it. Like I have to make this happen. Um, and you just start building a bit of integrity with yourself, right? Just for the listeners, if yeah. I could interrupt, uh, for those of you who don't know what 75 hard is, um, hashtag 75 hard is a program put up by at Andy Frisello on Instagram, who is, um, well, both of our mentors, me and Byron, and he's someone who really knows what he's talking about. So check him out if you haven't already. And uh, look at 75 Hard. You'll find the pictures everywhere. If you can just yeah, Google it. So, yeah, but exactly. if you go on, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> That's all good, man. Um, so, yeah, I built my own version of that. Um, and I just execute it on it every day. And it was the, the stringing together of the little wins every day that just started like fixing the confidence levels. And I started having a bit more integrity in myself. And I started believing that actually, maybe this could happen. Maybe you could do this. Maybe you can achieve what it is you want to do. And then sort of one of the things was the progress picture every day. So I did the progress picture every day. I, made, I trained with intention. Like before that, I was going to the gym, but I was kind of just going through the motions, just ticking boxes, right? Yeah. yeah, it wasn't. No, it was just, it was another way of not having to deal with real life. So I could go to another place where oh, I felt safe. Progress. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and I started training with intention, started drinking a lot more water, do my progress picture. And then all of a sudden, like 90 days in, I looked at it and I was like, I didn't see any difference until I looked at day one's photo versus day 90's photo. And I was like, wow, these are two different people. And like you start thinking about how you think in a mental place as well, how much clearer I was in decision-making. And like, I mean, your business starts thriving for it because um, you think you're going to do all of this and you're going to take away from your business, right? Because that's what most people do. They're like, there's no ways. I don't have half an hour to meditate today. I don't have like an hour to gym every day because I'm so busy at work. It's like, well, you can't afford not to gym it every day and you can't afford not to meditate every day because that shit catches up on you. And then you're so much more inefficient at the stuff that you do than if you did that hour and a half every day of like self care or self love. Um, so just, yeah, started doing a bit of that. And then eventually a goal was to be in the best mental and physical shape of my life. And I was like, well, how the hell do you measure that? Like I can measure the physical side of things. Like I can tell my body fat percentage. I can look at like, I can measure muscle mass and stuff. And that, that's an easy one. But how do you measure your mental state? Like that's, that to me, I still haven't managed to work out how I did it. Maybe but further on another episode. I... Maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, I then, that's when this, the project came along and I was like, actually, if anything's going to test my mental state, that's going to be it because I know I've got the physical dialed in, like I feel pretty good, but the mental side of stuff, when, when you've got your back against the wall and you've got to really start like trying to think clearly under pressure, under immense pressure, like that's when you can test your mental states and whether you're going to break down or whether you're going to have that self-confidence to go, actually screw this, I can do this. Just take one more step, just do one more thing, just like, and just, 
you don't have to win right away. You just got to take that next step. And then you got to do that extra push up. You got to do that extra or whatever. Like if there was a lot of times where it was like, they put us against each other and it was like, I don't have to win against everyone. I just have to win against that guy that I'm facing right now. And it was like, okay, if I beat him, then I just have to beat whoever these two beat. And it's like, yeah. So you don't, so it, this is where like my sporting background actually helped me out a lot. Cause I think unless you play in like a high or not, maybe not even a high level of sport, but if you've got a, an aptitude for sports, you, you kind of get very good at focusing on the here and the now, what can I control in this minute? That's going to give me the best possible result in five minutes or in an hour. Not, I'm going to focus on the end result. The end result is, is too far away. You can't do anything about that end result. But what I can do is I can control what happens right this second that then will have a carry on effect and that will impact later down the line. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, from a brain perspective, it's about focus. If your brain is a master at filtering out information. So there's something mm -hmm. called the RAS or reticulate, the, the activating system, if I can yeah. pronounce it properly, um, basically um, filters out the vast majority of information that comes into our, into our mind or brain. So if you were in a room, for example, like I am now, you probably aren't gonna know what the color of everything is because you'd go crazy thinking about too many things at the same time. So your brain filters out all this information and you focus on a very small part of things. So focus is one of the most important things in life and business, absolutely, because if you focus on where you want to go instead of where you don't want to go, um, for example, if you're always thinking, oh, I'm so depressed, I'm so sad, instead of going, actually, I'm depressed, I'm sad, why don't we use that as a powerful motivating factor to go on and do something better or, or new or grow as a person? And that's how... I personally got out of depression through growth because without growth, humans don't have feel that core human need of like the, 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 the progress that or else you're just stagnant and then you will be depressed. It doesn't matter how far you've got. If you stop, you'll start to feel bad about it. And that's something that not many people are willing to say on the internet, which is why I feel so passionate about saying it. So yeah, thank you for letting me interrupt. <laughs> no, it's all good. So yeah, it was just a case of, again, if we reel it back, like just focusing on what I can control in this moment. Don't worry about what's to come because that, that's another one. Like, again, I think I was quite fortunate in that I picked up on the trend pretty, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I realized that they're doing that whole, like where they squeeze you into a point and it's like, they try and trigger you to bounce you through your emotions. So they pick you up super high and then they pull you down super low and they just bounce you. And um intentionally toying with your emotions basically. hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's all mind games. Wow. It's a lot of mind games. Like the physical side, they drain you physically. They train you. Uh, they, they sleep deprive you. They, um, they don't, they don't feed you nearly enough um, for the level of activity you're doing. What but were the tools you used to make through that? Because it sounds incredibly intense. What were the mental tools or, or things you were thinking at the time that, that got you through such tough uh, challenges? So I think I, I try and simplify everything. Like I, I, I hate overcomplicating stuff. That's why I think I was a good business analyst and a good project manager. I was like, what's the path of least resistance? What's going to give us the biggest return for the least amount of effort? Right, we're going to go with that option and then keep it as simple as possible. So I literally did exactly that for this program where it was like, okay, I can think about what the 75 hours or 80 hours is going to look like and I can overcomplicate it and I can stress out about stuff that I don't even know whether it's going to happen or not. Or I can just focus on like, watch right now, get through this next evolution, get through this next piece of whatever. And that's all I did, man. I just, I simplified everything. I was just like, okay, yeah, well, we're going to do a marathon's worth of hiking today. Sweet. Fuck it. I'm just going to focus on taking one more step and then just one more step, one more step, one more step. Are we going to do a hundred pushups? Fine. I'll just focus on the next one. And like, yeah, I mean, they do this thing where they make you like watch the sun go down or something and they're like, oh, yeah, you're going to watch the sun come up in the morning as well. And it's like they, they leave it, but they don't tell you that you're about to get tortured. You jump to the conclusion that you're going to get tortured overnight. And it's like, and then preparing for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you start like panicking and, and overthinking and overcomplicating stuff. And I was just like, I've never been in this position before. I don't know what's coming. So me overthinking it and trying to predict 
is actually a massive waste of energy. And that's where that book, um, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, actually came in quite handy because it's all about like the energy allocation and stuff. Um, and I was just like, I'm just going to allocate my energy to stuff I can control. And the stuff I can't control, I'm just going to let it be, man. And that's all I did. And yeah, 80 something hours later, I was done and in the brotherhood. A really good point because a lot of people get very stuck. Um, they think of all the options and they sort of have this paralysis by analysis thing where they don't do anything. And I think um, just to emphasize Byron's earlier point about taking the first step, a lot of people see a mountain and they're like, oh no, shit, how am I going to climb that mountain? But you only know how to climb the mountain when you take the first step, which means you can take the second step and so forth. And then you make the top of the mountain by eventually, over the course of a long period of time, taking a lot of steps to reach the top. So um, I just want people to understand that it is you can you can get it can seem overwhelming at times when you see a mountain that you want to climb, whether that be in business, relationships, whatever it is. But at the same time, if you just take the first step, just do, oh, what do I need to do first? Do that. And then that's how you learn, that's how you grow. And you'll feel better about it that's you will feel happier about it that's something not many people do say <laughs> yeah exactly and like if, i don't know if i said this already but i have an if this then that mentality so i just it's okay i want that results what do i have to do to get that results okay i need to do these five things and i break them down to small bite-sized pieces and then that just makes the end result so much easier because you're stringing a lot of little wins together to then get that end result so it's like Let's say you want to make a million dollars, right? This is going to be the most basic example ever, but we're just going to try it. So you can go, well, a million dollars, that's a, sh- that's a shit ton of money. Like that's, that's a lot of hard work. But you could also say, well, I want to make a million dollars. That's 10 lots of 100,000. Yeah. And to, to earn 100,000, I've got to do 10 lots of 10,000 or whatever. You know? And you just you start breaking it down and then you, you, you get 10,000 and you're like, cool, I'm one tenth of the way to 100,000 and then you string a next and and you just build up and before you know it you're like actually earning seven figures yeah it's it's tough but it's not that tough like it's like everyone when I first started in business um especially in my consulting firm I was like six figures I want to earn six figures because I thought that that was going to be like the be all and end all and that was going to be a game changer and then you earn six figures and you're like hmm and was it I mean, if you get comfortable, like it's, it's nice not to have to stress about money. Um, but then there's different stresses because I was spending in direct relation to what I was earning. I was doing that typical dumb thing where I wasn't putting enough away. Um, so as much as I was earning, I was, I was spending at that level. Like I was, I was, I'm a good money spender. Like I've got that down to a <laughs> fine art. Yeah. <laughs> I saw your flat. So, I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I, I'm good at that. So like, um, Yeah. Oh, but going back to six figures thing. So I was like, oh, six figures and I made it and then I'm done. And then you get to six figures and you're like, actually, it's not, it's not that much. It's not that tough. Maybe I want seven, maybe I want whatever. And it, yeah, I don't but know. But you only it's, got there by taking the first step and then the next step. So yeah. for people listening, if you want to get, if you're not at six figures yet and you want to, you need to start taking steps towards that and that's going to look different for every person. So Mm -hmm. I can't give any specific advice, but start taking steps in the path you want to go uh, on the sort of job you want or lifestyle you want and see how, see you'll learn as you take the steps. Exactly. And just break it down to simple steps. Like if you want six figures, break it down into 10 lots of 10,000 or 50 lots of 20. 2000 whatever you know what i mean like just keep it simple and then tick those boxes and make sure you're measuring one of the biggest things i realized was that i wasn't measuring my goals for a long time so i was just kind of aimlessly going and i wasn't sure whether i was even on the right track and then all of a sudden it was like actually if i measure this i can 100 percent know whether i'm on the right track or not and you do that i did this in business my whole life but yet when it came to my personal stuff i wasn't doing it that's dumb as hell so i was like okay what did, what do I want? And I put like tangible stuff in place. I was like, I want to have a hundred thousand by the end of the year. Okay. You want that? What do you need to do each and every single day in order to make sure that at the end of the year, you're on a hundred thousand or at the end of the year, you're 6% body fat or whatever, which is my goal this year. So like, I know that at some stage this year, I'm going to hold 6% for at least a month. Um, I know what my macros need to be for that. I know what my training needs to look like, etc. Planning for success, um, basically. Planning ahead. And, and then, 
and I, and I tick the boxes every single day. I know I need to do these 10 steps every single day to get to whatever it is I want to get to. And then it's just a tick box exercise and you just get there and you do it. And this is something so, that um, 75 Hard has taught me is um, your mind will trick you into thinking, oh, um, I have this excuse, so I can't do that. I have this excuse, so yeah. I can't do that. But the truth is everyone has excuses. Everyone yeah. in the world. It's freezing cold outside. I just got back from a, cold, like a run in the freezing cold British weather. And yeah, I had the excuse it was cold. I had the excuse it was freaking dark, but I went anyway. And when you overcome that uh, obstacle of in your mind of, oh, there's this excuse, but here's my goal. In order to reach my goal, I need to do X, Y, Z. And then you actually do X, Y, Z. That builds confidence in you. That builds self-confidence. That builds faith in your ability because you've built up a track record with yourself in the past of doing the stuff you say you're going to do. So that's something exactly. that is really important. And I'm really impressed by Byron because he's someone who is a very rare example of that, who actually does what he says he's going to do. So yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I don't have a hell of a lot to add to that. Actually, you've, you've kind of hit the nail on the head. It's just, you build that integrity, you just build up and then it gets to a point where you have a track record and, and it's the pain of breaking that track record versus the pain of actually dealing with it snowing outside. You're like, I would, I will go and fight a polar bear outside. Yep rather than give up this winning streak because you know once you've broken that streak once damn dude like it's hard you, to get that that is shattering like the first time i broke my diet at the end of last year and i needed to because i i had like been low carb for so long that it was actually starting to get to a point where it's like kind of unhealthy um so i was like and like i think i showed you my results right on my blood work like yeah. uh, my blood work was pretty shit i mean it's not like i was dying but it was like <laughs> you should probably start self-care a little better right um so i had to then start fixing my diet and and doing that but like breaking the um the record was was tough man i was like fuck i've done this for like 120 something days now of literally a spotless track record mm -hmm. and then you break it one day and, and it's crushing i was like this sucks but we're back on it so that's the main thing absolutely i'd love to emphasize on that point because emotions again are really misunderstood in society as a whole and happiness people see happiness as this target for success right but I, happiness at the end of the day is always going to be temporary always so if that's your target for success your success will be temporary we should see happiness as it is it's a it's a release of brain chemicals in your brain particularly dopamine serotonin and a bunch of other neurochemicals that we won't get into uh, but um it's a chemical soup in your brain that, that tells you, oh, I'm in the state of happiness. And if you want to achieve that more often than not, um, so for me, happiness is about a percentage, not a all or nothing. It's not 100% happy, 0% unhappy. It's more like for my life, it's pretty high. Honestly, is 90% happy, 10% unhappy. But mm -hmm. I just want to emphasize that point. People beat themselves up when they're unhappy in that 10%. But don't focus on the 90% of their life which is actually going really well so if you're ever in a state of a mental state of what do I do next I always come back to gratitude so being grateful for the things that I have always a makes me happier b um, goes actually it's okay to want more out of life it's okay but I can also be grateful for the shit I have at the moment at the same time as going after bigger goals so for me, happiness is a very complicated topic to talk about and which is why I want to talk about it more on the podcast because it's so misunder misunderstood. But yeah, what's your take on, on happiness, Byron? <laughs> so I actually didn't fully understand it or I didn't have a good way of explaining it until I did a YouTube video on it a while back. And I said, it's like that one-way glass when you see on TV and you go, they're interrogating someone on the other side of the glass and you can see information going one way, but it doesn't come the other way. Um, and the way I envision it in my head is if something is like toxic or something's going badly, I try and put that thing on the other side of the one way glass so I can feed information through this way, but it can't come out the other way. And then it's like in this own little box. And if you continue doing the good stuff well, and you still build up that like track record there, naturally it's going to filter through the one, this one way glass and fix whatever the, the wrecked stuff is on the other side. Um, 
And I used to not be able to do that where I would let one little thing of toxicity like make everything else toxic. And then I was super miserable, super unhappy and stuff. But instead now I kind of decompartmentalize it. I think that might be the right word. I'm not hundred percent sure. But anyway, I rip it out of the situation and I focus on that as its own little thing. And then I'm more worried about making sure that I stay because like, I think I've told you this before Vince, but I'm a professional self-destruct person like there's there's not a hell of a lot of people on earth that can do a better job at self-destructing than me like i've got that down to fine arts um and this was one of those situations where like one little thing goes wrong and i'm just like self-destruct button let's go um whereas now i focus on like the controllables what i can make sure that i can maintain and be happy with and then i just let that kind of fester and do its own thing on the side and eventually it comes right because the positivity and stuff that you're building on the good side filters through to the bad side so like you said where there's percentages i try and never let it get above like 25 percent if it is i need to then walk away find go and do something that like i'm passionate about so that's why um like actually this is a good example like if i'm super fired up at work right and i'm ready to like rip someone's throat out i'll just like i'll walk away i'll go and get a coffee i'll go um and just remove myself from the situation for a while so that i don't end up like adding that toxicity to everything make yourself you know, out of the situation first yeah yeah exactly and then because if you also if you're always reacting to the emotion every time you're always going to overreact I, I do anyway i don't know about everyone else maybe other people are different but damn dude, I will overreact and I'll lose it completely. And I have like this red mist kind of switch that just goes. And then all of a sudden I'm like half an hour later, I've, there's this path of destruction behind me. And I'm like, that could have been avoidable if I had just taken a deep breath and got out of fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. So I now I remove myself from the situation. I'll go over the road, I'll grab coffee, I'll go, I'll go to the gym and I'll work out, whatever, but I'll get away from it. And then I'll come back and deal with it at a later stage. And maybe some people will say that's running away or whatever, and that's fine. I'll take it. But I know that for me, that's the best result or the best way of handling something. Because if I don't do it that way, there's a path of destruction. And the, the, the bad is far outweighs the good when I do that. Yeah, so Absolutely. And it's, at the end of the day, humans are emotional creatures. Um, a lot of people like to pretend like they're the like this God on the internet who knows all the answers, but no one knows all the answers. That's the thing. Everyone else, everyone on the, this planet is trying to figure stuff out. No one knows everything. And that's something that's been lost in society today where people are trying to be the guru of this or that or that instead of just being honest and going, yeah, I know a lot about this, but about this, I don't know so much. Yeah. No one is perfect. And what every human on earth, when we get angry, myself included, we do stupid shit. And yeah. I'm happy to admit it because it's the truth, but not everyone is. So I just want to remind people that it's okay to get angry. Just remember to try and, like Byron was explaining, to remove yourself from the situation before you escalate it to a point where it goes into like a full blown thing rather than keep it small by removing yourself getting yourself into a mental state of mind to tackle the situation with a calm mind. Yeah, exactly. Get out of that fight or flight state and then deal with it in, a, in, in the way that it should be dealt. Don't like I try and rather than react, I try and be proactive. Um, and obviously that's impossible. You can't always be proactive. Sometimes you're just going to have to react. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, like you've got more time to think about what you're going to do before you have to do it. Like everyone thinks like you have to make decisions like this. And it's when I actually really started thinking about it properly. And I was like, actually, I don't need to make a decision right now. I can cool, I can cool my jets for a minute and actually come back to this in 10 minutes. Like this is not, there's very few situations where you're in a life or death situation. And like the decision you're about to make has impacts on people's lives like that realistically none of us are in that situation maybe if you're a police officer or first responder that's then different ball game altogether 100 percent. you need to be switched on but like you me and everyone else that average joe man you've got more time than you think take a breath relax take back like, take a minute you bring up a really good point because um, you've reminded me of when I worked as a doctor in hospital. So a lot of times there were situations where it was literally life or death. So being under that sort of pressure has sort of helped me personally to make better decisions, even under stress and under pressure. So where there's literally at times minutes on the line before someone dies, you have to make decisions fast. 
And it's always better to make a decision rather than do nothing. No decision. Yeah. So I just really want to emphasize that. Just do something. You don't know if it's right or wrong until you do it. But once you do it, you'll know. And then you'll course correct after that. So, yeah, yeah take the first step. Get the momentum exactly yeah start start the ball rolling and then yeah you can it's like um did you ever drive a car that didn't have power steering yes okay so you know when this car is stationary how hard is it to turn this turn the steering it's around? crazy hard like, it's like impossible you, you just you get like bicep veins popping and all sorts because it's just like the most hardcore arm workout you've ever had but get that car moving like even just one mile an hour and how much easier is it to course correct and move the tires it's the same thing with life dude like you try to stay still and move or try and stay still and turn the steering wheel you've got nothing like a little bit of momentum and all of a sudden shit gets a whole lot easier you just start cruising and gliding absolutely and something i want to emphasize here because we're talking about momentum is a lot of people get into situations where they try and go too many directions at once so they spend like say 10 percent of the energy on 10 things rather than 100 percent of the energy on one thing where mm. if you really want results in anything you have to put 100 percent energy focused energy at one time on one thing whether that be a your relationships be your finances or business however you want to put it or, or your job or whatever your role is, you have to think about like life in these different compartments. Oh, I'm going to put energy here. It may take away from here temporarily, but again, I'll reinvest there later on. So I just want to emphasize this because it's been such a powerful lesson for me in my business. Like when I focus on one thing at a time, I get so much better results and it's an exponential scale than if I try to do 10 things at once. hundred percent. Yeah, I agree with that full-heartedly yeah you can cycle between them but you try and do too many things at once you're gonna that's like juggling right yeah you, you, much, juggling. it's a point where you just drop everything because you just can't you can't keep them all up so yeah and you may 100%. be able to, to juggle and there's some people who might be able to do that but you'll never be able to run and juggle and run a business and have relationships that you want you have to start by taking the steps but even if you're like even if you are a good juggler you're still inefficient at all of them like you're not optimizing everything whereas if you just focused on and it's maybe it's a scheduling thing or whatever but if you if you put everything into one thing at a time it's game changer dude it's it's honestly in my experience and and it sounds like in your experience too it's it is a game changer <laughs> yeah oh you yeah it's, it's like you can't even quantify the, the results it's it's beyond anything that you can put into numbers because it's like yeah we leave it at that it's, it's kind of so if you harness it on the right things you focus it on the right things you can filter out all the the stuff you don't want in your life and that's something that people aren't tend to not talk about because it's not a comfortable topic to talk about where you spend less energy on say your uh, old older friends for example like um people that you <laughs> have lost touch with that's okay um and in society i seem to th uh, well, i've seen on instagram it seems to be that some people don't think that's okay so i really want to emphasize it's totally okay to put energy where it matters to you personally yeah 100 percent. if you're hanging on to people just because you went to school with them like you're broken fix yourself like you have zero loyalty to someone that you went to school with <laughs> you're a different person used to, like i'm 30 years old dude i haven't seen some of these people for 12 years you think i give a shit what they're doing or what their opinion is of me like it doesn't matter they're not paying my bills at the end of the month that's not so and i think that's why you're more yourself. successful than most people because you have that mentality but not everyone yeah. does some people no, that's true. well most people don't <laughs> honestly think that way so i think it's really important like if you want to model someone model someone you who has the results you want not yeah. not like if you're gonna uh go to the gym i would listen to someone like byron who clearly has a lot of muscle and knows what he's talking about as opposed to this random skinny dude next to me in the gym who claims he knows what he's talking about but his results and his physique say differently so it's really important to model or only listen and take advice from people who have the results you want but also like do your research because I can, I can be anyone on the, online, right? I can, I can make out like I'm a billionaire. <laughs> it, it does, it's not difficult yeah. to get done, yeah. Yeah. but you only have to do like 10 minutes on Google searching and you'll realize that if I was trying to portray that, that I would be full of shit. Yeah. 
Mm. So, so just do some research. Like, don't be a dumbass. Don't just assume everyone is coming at you and that everything that is said is, don't take it at face value because okay. it's easy to be someone that you're not, especially for a short period of time. Like you see all these guys selling courses on Instagram and stuff. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll make you rich overnight. The reason they're getting rich is because you're <laughs> buying their courses. And they yeah. actually know how to get rich. It's crazy. And all, they, all they're doing is they're recycling free content from Ed Milet, Andy Frisella, yeah. Gary Vaynerchuk, Bedros. They're just the recycling stuff that you could get for free really? and they're selling you. And all of a sudden you thinking that, oh yeah, this is valuable because I'm having to pay for it. No, it's not. It's not any more valuable. Actually, you're getting washed out information. Go to the source. Go to the guys that are actually making money. Like, if you want to know who's successful, go on Forbes Rich List yeah. or something. Don't, don't look on Instagram. Don't be an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fantastic point. So Byron likes to cut straight to the chase. Uh, I, I love that about him. That's why I'm friends with him. Uh, so I hope you guys appreciate that because not everyone will tell you that. Like, we're saying this as because we want to help. Like, if you want to make progress in life, then only listen to advice from people who have the progress rather than let's say for example your mum or dad who may not be as successful in the areas you want to be successful in um why not model people who have the results you want i think it's, exactly. it makes sense and don't model people that are like the same level as you either like go shoot for like i'm not about to model someone that's doing six figures like why would i do that if i'm if i'm wanting to get seven eight nine figure businesses you model those people don't like if everyone shoots too low they go because it's a comfort zone right you're like oh i could i could potentially achieve that so i'm going to follow this like i'm going to do that set your goal to have an eight-figure business mm -hmm. and then like align the work ethic to that and then there's no chance you can't succeed like you literally it has to happen because you're putting in the work you've got the right drivers you've got the right mentors you've got the right people that you're modeling you're taking Whereas, steps like, you need to get to where you want to go on yeah. your on the mountain you want to climb so yeah. and it's not like you know this you probably know about the secret right um and we they like you just put on a vision board and then one day it'll come true no that's not it doesn't really work like that like you still gotta you gotta match that vision with the work ethic um but I met the guy like, who produced that actually. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. But like, but, it, but if you look at his work ethic, it's like it's through the roof. He's he does like twenty hour days, and that's why he's there. But like, is it that Rhonda Byrne? Is that her name, Rhonda? I can't remember her name. But anyway, um, yeah. But her work ethic is insane. Like she's not just putting a picture up on the wall and going, "Oh, one day I'm gonna own this house." No, she has. She's got her vision, which is the picture. But then she's aligned all of her goals and her strategies and everything to that. If this, then that mentality, right? This is the end result. What do I do? Work it backwards. Job done. Absolutely. And just to share a bit of my story, like people see my work ethic now and they think, "Oh, Vince, you must be superhuman," but. The truth is, I did not always have this work ethic. I did not. I, honestly, I was one of the laziest students in the um, Snap. And yeah, I was sort Bare of minimum. the procrastinate insane amounts. Like I was like on another level in terms of procrastination. Like for example, to give you a level, I literally in my med school first year, spent about a week revising when everyone else is spending about six months so i managed to scrape by by the skin of my teeth but that's not how i live anymore and i think that comes down to what you value in yourself like do you do you value like oh appearing smart or actually being smart would you rather put in the hours and actually learn stuff or just pretend you know what you're talking about and for me i always chose after that point um, because there was a point where I failed uh, a year of med school and it really forced me to go actually Vince you're not a genius you have to actually put some work in and that forced me on this path of actually going actually hard work and work ethic is something to value in yourself like if you're the sort of person who puts your value on effort rather than results then you're going to be putting in more effort and you'll feel good about that and that's the stage I've got to now which is why I share this story with you guys because hopefully you guys can reach this level too, where you have a self-awareness where you're happier when you put in more effort. What's your take on that, Byron? hundred percent. Like you literally, the, the harder you work and the more effort you put in, the better you feel about it and the more the results happen. And then it's just this like 
snowball. It's the snowball that just gets out of control. But as I'm soon as you stop, pushing the snowball off because you've yeah. Been there, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but you've like you've put in the work, and then you've off. Oh, but so, have you ever you've have you ever won anything like anything in at terms all? Of like or... yeah, like won money or anything probably if i think back far enough but it's been a while <laughs> but like okay so how much better did you feel when you won a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds versus when you earned it like there's something about earning shit and you can only earn it by putting in the work Very like no one earns anything by chilling mm -hmm. that's why like people who win the lotto and stuff they, they blow their money and they do dumb shit because they haven't earned it they don't have a respect for what they've had to do in order to achieve what it is that they get same as like these rich kids who like i'm in orange county at the moment there's a lot of really rich kids mm -hmm. um they're driving lamborghinis and all sorts of beautiful cars that are and i get serious fear of missing out kind of stuff i'm like fuck where's yeah. my lambo kind yeah, of thing but <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there we'll get there but like, yeah. they don't have, they just they've never had to work a solid day in their life or earn anything so they don't have that respect for it it's just like oh dad will pay or mom will pay or whatever whereas like when you've earned it and you get to wear that with pride like this jacket i mean i think it's it's probably like a 50 dollar jacket but do you know how much I had to bleed and sweat to earn this thing? Like I will fight a grizzly bear to yeah. keep this jacket. Wow. Simple. It's a fifty. It's Is that 50 the logo bucks. of the process? Yeah. Wow. Because it means a so, lot. Yeah, dude. Because you've earned it. You've had to put in work. You've you've bled. You've sweat. You've fucking cried for this shit. Hmm. Like you've had to do stuff to you earn went it. Torture just, to earn that thing. Yeah, so. man. So like, there's 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 another level of value these days. Like you can buy anything, dude. It's, the dark web and the internet and stuff. Anything's for sale now. It's ridiculous. But the stuff that you actually have to earn and you put the work in, it's like that, you can't take that away. And if you, if you try, you'll fight your ass off to have it back. Because you've earned it, you've put in the work. That's just like Simon Cowell has been broke like what seven times or something stupid, and now he's he's back to well, being like wealthy as hell. Yeah, yeah he's, he's he's literally sunk his business a handful of times, and now he's he's crushing it again. But like he he knows the work ethic. He's put in the work to know how to be successful. So even if he does screw it up and goes bankrupt, he knows what it takes to get back there. Whereas if like average Joe on the street, if you've won the lotto. Well, you you quickly like blow all your money and you give right. it all up because you don't understand mm. what it took to get to that level of wealth. And you'll never be happy at the end of the day because a lot of people don't understand the the uh, the implied things of having a lot of money. A lot of so-called friends will appear out of the woodwork and oh, ask dude, you. For trust money. me, I know about this. Holy shit, yeah. I know about that. Yeah, I've experienced you that. You go out to dinner and all of a sudden the check comes and everyone kind of looks at you because you, they know you're the you're the high owner of the group. And it's like, oh, yeah, don't worry, Byron's got this. And you're like, oh, is that why you came to dinner? Not because you wanted to hang out with me, because you wanted a free meal at an expensive restaurant in London. Like, mm -hmm. okay, cool. Yeah. You start to, and then when the money starts disappearing, so back, back to if we rewind sort of 20 years ago now, um, we were pretty well off in South Africa. Shit went pear-shaped, lost a lot of money. And all of a sudden you watch how many people disappear because the gravy train stops. Like my parents owned restaurants and businesses and stuff. And all of a sudden, like economy got a bit bad. I think they made a couple bad decisions. I don't really know the ins and outs of it, but we went from being very well off to struggling, dude. And all of a sudden the people that were on the gravy train and they would come to the restaurant because they knew they would get free drinks and free food every day and stuff. All of a sudden, when you like, you pick up the phone, you're like, Hey, do you guys want to hang out? And they're like, Oh, are we coming to the restaurant? You're like, no, we're just going to chill. And they're like, no, we're good. We'll come to the restaurant because we know there's food, but otherwise now we're chilled. And you're like, Oh, so it's just about like, people are fickle. Yeah. And so like one of the things about earning money and stuff is know your circle that's one of the things that like you probably know this but like there's not many people in my circle dude like i don't i don't socialize with a lot of people I, I know a lot of people and i have a lot of acquaintances but like to get into the inner circle this, this, I, I don't just accept anyone anymore i used to i just used to be like oh i'm friends with this person you won't hear me call many people friends you'll hear me say i know this guy or i know of this guy but i'm not going to be like oh that guy's my friend like vince is my friend but there's not many I don't have many friends for that exact reason because you keep your circle tight. And just to explain this from a brain perspective, you, you only have so much energy as a human. There's only so much energy and that will depend on how much you eat, etc. But 
if you give all your energy to other people and don't save enough for yourself and the people that actually matter to you, your core group, your tight circle that you um, pers purposely built over time, um, you're not going to have enough energy to spend on the people that matter. So for me, I think you make a really good point, like having a core group of people, your inner circle, as you call it, is really important because those are the people who will support you through the bad times and through the stuff. And that's something that I've learned more recently is having more success in my business is mm -hmm. a lot of people will appear out the woodwork who've never spoken to you in years because they're like, oh, you're, you, you're, you're seeing progress. Mm -hmm. But you need to understand as Byron says, people are fickle and there's certain people you don't want around you who are there for the wrong reasons. And it's very easy to tell, especially if you understand how the mind works like I do. So it's very easy to tell for people who are successful. So you can't game that. That's all I'm going to say. Well, I mean, you can try, but like yeah, they, they're successful for a reason, right? Because they know they've got their bullshot radar works pretty good. Yeah. So like they'll, they'll be on to you. Maybe, they, maybe you'll, you'll be able to fake it for a couple of days maybe a week or two maybe even a month or two but eventually they're just like okay i'm onto you i know what's up um and that's a dangerous game because like let's use like andy frisella for example right if you if you are that way with him and he cottons on to the fact that you're just there or you're just trying to get in that in a circle just for the free ride that his you bullshit can get your ass. so good but yeah but assuming you get to bullshit him right um and you get in there for a couple of days. What like he will make sure that everyone he knows in his circle knows that you're a bullshitter, mm -hmm. and then the chances of you breaking that reputation from that point on That's is right. like impossible. So you you're done. You're better off just actually being a genuine person and actually like doing the right thing and building your own value. And inevitably, then you'll fall into those kind of circles. And you will have earned your way there. It's again, it's not just a gifting. You have to earn your way in. Exactly. It's earned. And a lot of people get confused by that. So that's why I really wanted to emphasize that point. <laughs> but that's the whole social media thing, isn't it? Like this is my biggest problem with social media is that it's instant gratification. Like I'm going to post a picture and I know I'm going to get a hundred likes or a right. thousand likes or a million okay. likes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's just, it's yeah. So now everyone wants the exact same thing out of life. It's like, <laughs> When I was still in, in London doing my consulting firm, um, I had a dude come and say to me like, oh, what does it take to start a consulting firm? I was like, well, to be honest, dude, it's, it's pretty simple to start a business. Anyone can do it. It doesn't cost you a hell of a lot of money. You go to the bank, you set up a bank account, you go to a um, company's house, you register a business name. Um, it's 12 pounds to set up a, a comp, like register a, comp, a new company in UK. It's yeah. It's, it's nice, right? So anyone can do it. It's just, the barrier to entry is low as hell. Yeah. But then I said, okay, now you're a business owner, but that doesn't mean you make money. Yeah. I said, now, like when I did it, I, had, I reached out to like 180, 185 businesses or something stupid like that before I actually got my foot in the door somewhere. Mm, first like most, people, most people give up after five. And I was like, well, I'm kind of like, I've got, this is a single swim situation, so we're going to have to do it. And you you play the number game and you get on with it. But like I, when I said to him, I was like, well, you know, you, you might have to reach out to 180 companies like me. Maybe you'll get lucky again, the first 10 and all of a sudden you'll land one. Maybe my sales is not that good. That's probably a flag for me that I need to work on my sales technique. But like maybe you're going to have to do 185 presentations. And he's like, oh, I don't want to do that. Like I want to, I just want my business to be, I'm like, dude, what? what world do you live in where you think that like you're going to set up a business and tomorrow you're going to be worth six figures or seven figures. It doesn't work, but everyone on social media is selling you on that dream. Mm. And because it makes the money and schools as well, though schools come and get this degree and next year you'll be earning a hundred grand a year. Come and get an MBA and you'll be half a million. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. I literally had a falling out with one of my lecturers because he was like, Oh yeah, if you get this business degree, um, when they were trying to make me do an MBA and I, I wasn't really having it until they actually gave it to me for free because I was playing sport for them. Mm -hmm. um, but they were trying to say like, yeah, you, you get an MBA and we'll guarantee you that you'll earn half a million like within your guarantee. first two years. Yeah. I was like, how can you, how can you guarantee that to me? How can you? It's impossible. And the guy's like, well, you know, I've, I've got at least two of my students. I was like, okay, so two out of how many people? So, but now you've, you're giving everyone a guarantee. That's, a, that's a whole different ball game. So, yeah, like it's just this instant gratification thing that really triggers me as well. 
yeah, just talking about universities, like uh, coming back to listening to people have the results you want, a lot of these lecturers, like professors, et cetera, they're, they're earning quite well, but if that's what you want, then maybe model them. But if that's not what you want, then you don't have to listen to everything they say. They, they'll give you good advice on certain things, but maybe not about finances, for example. So, yeah. <laughs> If they're not on a half a million, how are they going to advise you how to be on half a million? That's all I'm going to yeah. say. They're going to teach you from a book that they read. And that book was written by someone 10 years ago and those principles no longer valuable. Like they don't, uh, the world, like today everything moves so fast okay. that like what worked six weeks ago doesn't potentially work. doesn't even work anymore. Like you, you go into Instagram and you try and model someone and you try and like copy their strategy. In six weeks time, no. uh, the algorithm's changed. So you, you, it's a constant learning. If you don't love the process, which goes back to the happiness side of things that you touched on earlier, if you don't enjoy what you're doing and you don't enjoy the process of constantly learning and developing and growing, like change your career because you, you're always going to be average at best. If you really want to succeed, you got to love what you do and wake up in the morning and eat, breathe, whatever that shit. Like exactly. it's, it's a full-time job, just staying on top of everything exactly and people see like some of the success i have and they don't see how much work i'm putting in behind the scenes i post a lot on social media but there's a lot of pe things people don't see me do which is going on behind the scenes and if people saw the level of work ethic i put into things it might scare them honestly <laughs> how, how old are you Vince? uh 28 this year 28 right you put ten thousand and some change hours into brain studies now, if you try and work that yeah, back, <laughs> a lot. Yeah, but, okay, let's, let's just say 10,000 for a round number, right? It's, let's say, it's, what is it? Maybe 15, 20,000? Yeah, closer to 100, yeah. Okay, even, Jesus, even more, man. But like, if you now work that back backwards to how many years of work that is, and everyone's only seeing this finish line now because you're active on social media and stuff, and they're like, oh, well, Vince, Vince was this overnight success. Why can't I be? But they don't see that you've put in, you've yeah. literally bled and sweated for yes. a decade and change to get to where you are now and that's that's unfortunately the the um the downside of social media where everyone There's just sees the finished product it's good and bad at the end of the day for me i'm not saying social media is necessarily bad i'm just saying it's a tool that mm -hmm. not everyone uses in the right way like some people use it to promote how awesome they are instead of to give value to people um which i think the future of business is all about giving value to people and I think 100%. connect through customers through social media because you build a sort of relationship with your following and they sort of get to know who you are as a person and people who trust you are much more likely to buy from you as a customer than people who have never heard who you are. So I yeah. see social media as a tool can be used for good or bad. It depends who's using it. Yeah. It's a, it's a way of generating warm leads basically because you're providing as a, whole lot of content and before you know it you then you ask for a sale but you've given people so much reason to buy up until that point that it's almost like a no-brainer to them they're like well this guy's literally changed my life free for the last six months now I'm not, he's offering this program can you imagine what he's going to do for me wouldn't i have to pay for a piece of content this content's going to be fire exactly That's so i'm um, so i'm like this is one of the gems that i'm currently like helping turn around here yeah. mm -hmm. and um like you can see it just in like what we do. We just add more value. Like we just come in and we give a shit about people and we listen to their problems. And if they come in and they say, you know what, I can't do this workout today because I've got a bad leg. Okay, well, what happens to your leg? Like talk me through what's the, where your pain's at. What can we do to make sure that you're still getting the workout, but we're taking as much pressure off your leg as possible and actually just giving a shit about people, adding value. And like we've seen the attendance go from like two or three people per session to like on Saturday, we had 30 something people in a session and we've only been doing this for like three weeks. That's amazing. It's wow. nuts. And it's just because we give a shit. We just care about people and we're like, okay, actually, yeah, how's your son today? I saw on, I saw on Facebook, it's, it's a two minute Google search or Facebook search, right? Of people, we, we've got a membership group. We just scan that every day and we go, okay, so-and-so's got this issue so and so is habit so and so was away this weekend when they come in all i'm going to do is i'm going to say hey how was your weekend in chicago what mm. did you do like oh i saw you were snowboarding that's about. amazing yeah even a shit dude and it doesn't take that long it's like a, it's a two minute exercise you're scrolling on facebook and rather than just scrolling for the sake of it you're actually just doing a little bit of investigation and you're going okay so when fucking joe soap comes in 
I'm going to ask them how their weekend was because their weekend looked pretty badass. And compared to my weekend, they had a great weekend. I worked all weekend. They didn't. So I'm going to find out and I'm going to kind of try and live vicariously through them. Yeah, absolutely. Like you build this rapport and this bond with people. And now, like we've got people coming through the door. They literally, they see the building and you see them like the face light up because they're stoked to be here. And now they're bringing their friends. And we've seen membership grow from like 90 something to 120 or so. And it's just going to keep going because we actually give a shit. And it's again, like you said earlier about just adding value. Mm. It's not hard stuff, but was it either Ed or Andy, one of them, I can't remember on one of their calls, the one that I actually may have watched for the first time in about a year being part of this and I still don't watch, but they said something about um, like the, um, the efficiencies or in the inefficiencies or something like that. Have I got that right? Have I bastardized that enough? Mm -hmm. But basically like if you just go out of your way to do the inefficient stuff, well, they're like the return on investment is so much higher than just like trying to automate everything and be like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just going to cut and paste this message and blast everybody. Like, no, people know people aren't dumb. We're not dumb. I know it's straight away within about a, 10 seconds of looking at a message whether it's an automated or it's really tailored for me even these guys now they're getting lazy with these handwritten notes and they're just like basically writing the same letter to everyone i'm like you know you open it if it doesn't literally say something that's personal to me i know yeah you took the time to write it by hand but you didn't you don't know who i am you didn't give me any kind of effort you've just you've cut and paste the fucking thing what you've done is instead of control c control v you've just done this just Mm. written it out screw you and I think it comes down to the intention behind whatever you're doing. Like mm. if your intention is to literally care about customers, when you do a handwritten note, you're going to look at their Instagram profile or whatever and find out a bit more about them and, and compliment on some, them on something they are, are, care about. And that shows you care about them as a customer. So yeah. as a business person, I find that strategy really works because it, it's an emotional connection. You actually show you care because you've taken the time and effort in efficiency to look them up. And not everyone, everyone tries to take the easy route, the, the shortcut, and it, it doesn't work anymore. In business today, especially if we're going to focus on businesses, people care about the inefficiencies, as Byron said. <laughs> yeah. If I'd, done, if I'd given this many shits about my consulting firm as I do about this little gym, Dude, my consulting firm would have been crushing it, but I just didn't. I didn't have that kind of love for banking or for my business at the time. Yeah, we did good numbers, but like I didn't. I didn't love what I did. I didn't wake up and go, "Oh yeah, I'm excited to do this today." <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I told you on like a daily basis. I was like, my exit strategy needs to come sharpish. And then I brought it forward by like three months or something. I just, it. I got back from the US and I pretty much shut down my business the next day. And I was like, I'm out of here. See you. I'm still paying rent in London. I was like, oh, I didn't care. Like, yeah, that was crazy. I needed out. I needed out. So it's tough, dude. Um, but yeah, just because it was toxic, it wasn't for me. But when you find something that you actually do enjoy, like the inefficiencies become easy. Mm. I didn't feel I didn't feel like I've done a day's work for a month and a half, even though I've been clocking up like, like stupid, stupid hours. But it's because you actually enjoy what you do, and you wake up, and it's like. Most of the time, I'm up before my alarm even goes off. That never happened as a consultant. Wow. And just to sort of round, round it all off, um, mm-hmm. but I'd just like to ask a couple of final questions. Sure. Um, so where do you see your future um, going forward into the next decade? What's your vision for where you, what you want to uh, do with your life? Professionally or personally? Or all whatever, of the above? However you want to answer that. Okay. Uh, so in terms of like, I guess, professionally, cause we've talked quite a bit about that. Um, I want to uh, make sure that I can stay in the U S so at the moment I'm on um, like a temporary visa of sorts. Um, so we dial that in, get that sorted so I can stay here full time. That'll be pretty sick. Um, and then it's just basically build it up, build that empire again, man. But in, in a ethical good way, not in a, Oh, what's going to pay me the most amount of money? Like the money's good. I'm not going to lie. Like anyone that tells you money's bad, like shut up. You've never, you don't have money. Like, yeah. yeah, it's like you, money's a good thing. It, it buys you a lot of freedom and everyone's like, Oh, I'm going to save the whales. I'm like, motherfucker, you can't save anything if you don't have money. Like you can't even save yourself. Yeah. You can't even save yourself, dude. So shut up, like burn in some money and then you can help the whales. 
until such time as you do that, you, you're a fucking talker, not a doer. Mm. So, like, yeah, get back into some decent money, start earning some good money again. And then, yeah, man, just give back. Stop being an actual good person. <laughs> like, I, I feel like I am a good person in general, but I could have been a lot better in London, and I'm, I plan to be a lot better here. So, Perfect. yeah set it up here and then yeah just enjoy life a bit more as well find that balance there is like i, I like working but i realized that it, i'm now using this it's almost like in again it's an escape for me to, to escape reality a little bit so i'm clocking up like a lot of hours because i don't really know that i have a lot of people here or anything like that so it's it's an excuse for me not to have to live that realization that i'm actually kind of lonely if that made, like in a sad sort of way um so yeah, dude, just clock up a lot of hours, um, sort out my business. I'd like to set up a business again. Um, I like working for people as well, but I also want my own thing on the side, even if it's not my my main income. Um, I've become very aware of the fact that a single source of income is a very dangerous place to live. Um, so multiple streams is the way forward. Pretty um, doing but- that. Like, um, just to do a shameless plug of your clothing label, for example. Yeah. Uh, uh, Byron has his own clothing label, so yeah. Why don't you mention that briefly? Um, well, I, I, I'm technically I'm not actually allowed to do it anymore because it's a conflict of interest with oh. what I'm doing now. So okay. I'm actually going to have to shut that down, which is not okay. a big deal. Okay. Um, no, that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's like just multiple streams where I'm, like yeah. have at least a number of different ways of making money, and it doesn't have to be like millions and millions. Just mm-hmm. like five or six streams of income, hundred grand each or whatever, I'll take it. Like that's good times. Um, whereas at the moment, like I've got one stream of income that gets cut off. You're like, you, that's where panic sets in, dude. You're, you're up shit Creek. So multiple streams of income sort of by the end of the year, I want to be on two or three, maybe not quite at six figures just yet. That, that'll be, I mean, if I can get that done, that'll be impressive. Um, especially having to just move new country and stuff. That's, that's going to take a whole lot of work. Um, but, yeah, so I've been here for like a month and a bit. I moved middle of December. It's now, what, February. So, yeah, a month and a bit. Um, but, yeah, multiple streams of income. And then sort of personally, um, I don't know, about 10 years. Um, but, yeah, just, just grow my network, start hanging out with some people, uh, not just using work as an escape all the time. Um, I don't really think 10 years in advance, to be honest, Vince. I'm, sure I'm more of a here and now kind of dude. Yeah, so I know what like the end game is. I've got my vision board and stuff. But, like, if I focus on that, that distracts me too much from the now. So I kind of I look at that in the morning when I'm getting dressed and I'm like, okay, that's the end game, I know. But in order to get there, i got to do these 10 things today or whatever. So I just tick the boxes every day. And that's where I'm at. And the last final question will be, what are what is your favorite uh, mental tool to get your mind right to get you in the in the peak mental state uh, to perform? That's a good one. I like that. Um, can I give two? Yeah, absolutely. So, so my first one will be just breathing, dude. Like I've realized very sharpish how the way in which you breathe determines what state your mind is in like if you shorter breath and stuff you straight away you go fight or flight like you can't even control it your body just naturally does it like anyone that says that they can they're like a superhero because that's the reality of it but so i just try and have step one for me is just focus on breathing like make sure that i'm actually breathing because i tend to hold my breath a lot even when i'm working out like i hold my breath and I'm like, why am I holding my breath? Like my muscles need oxygen to function and I'm holding my breath. That's dumb. So focus on my breathing. Um, and then the next thing will be um, just I try and start the day with a good intention. So I try and make sure that I'm grateful for a bunch of stuff. Um, and it can, it, may, it can be simple stuff like I'm grateful that the sun's shining today or it could be like real complex stuff like, oh, I'm super grateful that, you know, so-and-so bought me dinner last night because actually I was up shit creek and I was starving and my card got declined because fucking Monzo locked me out of my account for some <laughs> reason. And I'm like, why have you done this? This is unnecessary. Um, so, you know, it's just little things like that. Like just start in the right sort of headspace and then just breathe your way through stuff. Try and be, try and come from a, a place of um, like gratitude and breathe and the rest kind of takes care of itself. You think a lot clearer, you behave a lot better. Um, when you get worked up and you hold your breath, that's when things go pear-shaped real fast. 
agree. And just to emphasize that, I love that you bring that up because I'm actually, uh, I call it meditation, the, the breathing exercises. And a lot yeah. of people get really, really confused because I get messaged all the time. How do I meditate? And all, I find it's quite complicated to explain. So I'm actually building a, a video training course for meditation. That will be a nice. paid thing, but that will take a few weeks to build the whole thing out because I want to do it properly. Um, yeah, so shameless plug for that as well. <laughs> no, dude, plug away, man. I'm in for that as well. Like, remember I showed you that meditation thing that I was doing and you were like, uh, it kind of touches on the surface, but it doesn't go deep enough. Mm -hmm. I think there's a good, there's a lot of value in that because I don't think there's enough people that actually truly know what the hell they're talking about so they come and they scratch at the surface of a whole bunch of stuff but they never really get into any kind of depth where especially for me i need to understand like the details of it i'm detail driven so if you're like do this because i say so i'm like get out of here dude i'm not doing that shit like give me a reason i need to understand what the outcome is of me doing this i'm building it to be uh this is what you do and why and i'm going to explain the medical reasons why you should do things this way as opposed to this way when it comes to breathing um and coming from a doctor's perspective i've not seen anyone else do this so that's why i felt i had to do it myself i haven't so i like that idea as well and also you can then the, like you will know as a person doing it whether you're doing it right because you know how you should be feeling you, should, you know what state you should be in and the outcome and stuff so then you can go actually i'm i'm not in like he's saying that I should feel like this. I don't feel like this. So clearly I'm doing it wrong or I need to tweak something. And then you start like doing that self analysis, which then makes you better as in the long run as well. Whereas like a lot of these things, it's just like high level stuff. Oh, just breathe in, hold for two seconds, breathe out, hold for four seconds. And not you're like, effective. why, what is it doing me? It's what? not effective. Yeah. yeah. So fact, yeah, I like that idea. Like, man, big fan of that. I, I would, I would argue that I've not seen a single meditation course that, actually explains how it works so i'm building one yeah so Why not, <laughs> anyway. have you worked out what the price point of that will be yet or are you still working that um, out i'm still working on that it's going to be a few price points probably like beginner intermediate expert sort of nice. professional level subscription maybe. base uh i haven't thought i haven't got that far yet into okay. maybe we can talk about it off camera later i'm <laughs> yeah sure because i'm just thinking now in terms of like recurring income that's good times if you get like a, a um, subscription based kind of thing you've got a couple of chains of income coming in that'll work for you sorry that's my consulting brain just kicking in no 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 i love it, I love, it. <laughs> love it love the advice i'm definitely going to ask you a lot more questions fire away man you got my whatsapp number cool so thank you a bit for being on this uh at brain training university episode um so byron thank you again for spending your time with us thanks um, for having me and you're an incredibly inspiring person. Um, having met you, you're probably one of the most mentally tough people I know. He really is very humble when he talks about, especially the Navy SEAL training when he's been through some crazy stuff he didn't even mention on this episode. <laughs> so um, yeah, Byron, check him out on Instagram if you haven't already, at Byron Ovenstone. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Vince. See you later. See you, dude.